Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and today's topic is Databricks on Fire with Delta Live Tables. Before we jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you get specialized content and direct access to me among the benefits. Let's jump in. To understand what Delta Live Tables are, I'm going to give you a little bit of a story. I encourage you to stay with this because I think the value add to my channel is giving you the conceptual framework to understand what you're trying to do. Without understanding why you're doing something or where it's coming from, it's very difficult to be proficient at using it. So I'm going to start with a little story of the background on where Delta Live Tables came from. And I will give you a little spoiler alert. Delta Live Tables are designed to help you create end-to-end -end Databricks pipelines on Databricks. They are designed to work with Delta tables. But let me jump in more before we get to why, what, where, when. So we're starting with a kind of timeline, and it all started, this whole scale-out thing started with big data. And big data, we usually think lots of data, like high volume, like petabytes and zettabytes and whatnot. But it can also be media or sound files and all kinds of other things. So it can mean unstructured, structured, it can mean high volume, large amounts, but it can also mean kind of unusual data types that don't fit traditional data processing. So that's where it all began. And to support this, the first viable open source and very popular product was Apache Hadoop MapReduce. Now what Apache Hadoop MapReduce did was it proved the scaled out architecture to solving big data processing works by using more and more machines working in parallel under the covers to divide and conquer the processing of a big data pipeline, it could perform extremely well and it could scale really well, even as the volumes, for instance, went up. So that's what Apache Hadoop MapReduce did for us. However, there were a lot of issues with it. It was extremely hard to use. I know, I tried, I gave up on it, to be honest. I thought it was just more work than it was worth. It was orientated to be a batch centric engine. So the idea of this platform was it was going to create these batch jobs that you kind of walk away and come back later and it would eventually be done. And it would split up your work into sort of a layered tiers of tasks, but you had to be familiar with what it was trying to do and build your code to sync in with the framework that was there. So you couldn't just be oblivious to how MapReduce worked. You had to understand it quite a bit and it required Java coding. Yeah, I guess you could use other languages, but all the documentation and everything I kept finding was around Java. And with all these different things that you had to do, it was a very time consuming process just to get up and running and get anything to run. Certainly not intuitive at all and really not practical for any kind of complex solutions. So along came Apache Spark, another open source project. But Apache Spark, I think you could really see as being sort of the Hadoop done right. They solved a lot of these problems that you see here and you could jump in and use it. And so what Apache Spark did right off the bat was it provided a usable scaled up platform. Now, I hate to say this, I know a lot of people out there may still really like Hadoop MapReduce, but it wasn't very usable. And it did add some good ideas like Hive and other things on it to make it more usable. But in the end, it just wasn't as well thought out and it didn't make it easy to do big scale analytics. And Apache Spark came in and it did. Now I put Databricks there because the founders of Databricks, they wrote Apache Spark. And not surprisingly, they still maintain most of the open source code for Apache Spark. So it's important to realize this is connection. Well, what's the difference between O'Brien? What's the difference between Apache Spark and Databricks? Are they the same? No, they are and they aren't, okay? Databricks is provided as a cloud-only platform that wraps itself around Apache Spark and provides with all kinds of good services, including an IDE to develop your solutions, job processing, workflows, and all kinds of things to manage your clusters and run things. So the best way to see Databricks really is a wraparound service that is an enabler for Apache Spark. And you don't have to do a lot of low level work. You can just jump right in and start building data science or data warehouse pipelines right off the bat and start getting value. And that's what Databricks is all about. Now Databricks only runs on the three major cloud platforms. So Azure, AWS, and Google. Other ones are not available at this time. So the key takeaway there is Apache Spark is often, probably most times, on-premises, and Databricks is never on-premises. It only runs in the three major cloud. Apache Spark is sometimes enabled as a PaaS service. Like in Azure, you can do HD Insight. So sometimes you get that kind of an option as well. 
So what Apache Spark brought to the table that solved a lot of these problems was one, instead of being batch orientated, it was interactive. It also allowed us to use popular languages we want to use, like Python, SQL, and R, in addition to the native Scala. So I'm going to just kind of gloss over something else that was part of the evolution of Spark, but that was the addition of the SQL engine, which I just mentioned languages, but with that also the support for scaled out data frames and data sets. So that was a key thing to allow us to really work and get around the legacy Spark RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, which are really limited in many ways. This is great, but we still have a problem because now that Apache Spark came along, the data lake became super popular and everyone's like, great, we'll move everything over to the data lake and all our problems are solved. But they weren't because the data lake became the data swamp. Oftentimes when something new comes along, people kind of forget that there are reasons for the old ways. And one of the things that got thrown out the window was data governance. So not surprisingly, people just were throwing out any kind of data they wanted into storage, which was HDFS storage, where they could just query it, but there was no real governance and control around it. And worse, the formats available on Apache Spark did not allow you to change data. You could extract, copy, and do all these things, but it was all read on demand. So it was schema on read, query what you want, drop files in there. But the ability to do inserts, updates, and deletes that CRUD operations didn't exist. This was a problem because people started saying, hey, I want the functionality of my good old relational data warehouse. Why don't I have that? Where do we get that? And so that led to Delta Lake. Delta Lake is open source like everything else except for Databricks. And Delta Lake gave us CRUD operations and ACID transactions and on and on. But basically what Delta Lake gave us was SQL-like relational tables. We could do joins in all these things. We could do merge for updates. We could do inserts, updates, deletes. We had transaction logging, all these great things. So now we have something which really is very much like the good old relational data warehouse, but it's scaled out. So we get the benefit of that. Awesome. Maintainable data warehouses. But guess what? Writing the ETL pipelines was difficult and it was hard to maintain these. You're dealing with oftentimes here, the streaming types of things, lots of different data sources. Many of them are real time, get the data in instantly and we wanna see it and process it right away. And that's not easy to do. And so even though we can do all this merge and update operations, we're gonna to have to build some pretty complicated end-to-end -end pipelines to support the business needs. So that led us to Delta Live Tables. This is where we're at. I appreciate your patience here because it's important to understand this is where we're going. I think the culmination of all of this buildup to this point is in fact Delta Live Tables. Delta Live Tables are designed to get rid of all this complexity and building custom frameworks and one-off designs that solve each individual problem. Everybody's rolling your own stuff and it really isn't good for the future of the modern scaled out data warehouse. Now I do need to point out that Delta Live Tables are Databricks only proprietary service. So up till now, if you said I'm doing open source Spark, you can do everything I've talked about, including Delta Lake tables, but you cannot do Delta Live tables. So it's important to bear that in mind. If you're doing Spark, you can't do Delta Live tables. You need Databricks for that. So what do we get for this, Brian? What's the big takeaway? Well, the takeaway is we're getting automatic ETL maintenance and monitoring. And for that matter, almost automated development of our ETL pipelines. So when should I use this, Brian? What's the best use cases? Well, the best use cases are, first of all, as I mentioned, streaming, but also when you're doing like auto drop files kind of things, you've got files that will drop into storage. You want to ingest them right away and include them in your data warehouse. So those are good use cases. Generally large data volumes. This is something Databricks talks about in their documentation. If they're really small files, probably not necessary. Complex ETL, you got a lot of different feeds going to a lot of places. You've got it in intermediate storage from ingestion all the way to like cleaned up data to your aggregated data. So that's the idea behind it. And probably most importantly is this is only supported for Delta tables. So what does that mean? It means that you're really getting that sort of relational database functionality in a data warehouse, something that is very familiar to people who have had that. You cannot do it with other types of data formats. So the idea again is pipelines that are building a modern scaled out data warehouse. So let's take a look at how does this actually work? What am I gonna get for this? This diagram here is meant to show you pretty traditional, pretty simple data flow, a pipeline that you would build on your own. So let's assume you're building this from scratch and this could even go to a relational database. It, in this case, 
it doesn't even have to go to Databricks, right? It could go anywhere. But let's assume we have a couple of streaming event hubs. We've got one, a topic for store sales and another one for online sales, right? Okay, we got those going and we wanna bring those into our database. So the first thing we're going to do is have a table where we pull it in and our manually written pipeline is gonna say read from event hubs, stream in the data, and this could be Kafka as well, right? So we've streamed in the data and we land it into a Delta table. And that's just to hold the transactions as we get them. Now, since we're gonna to have to keep going back and getting new messages from event hub, we need to set a checkpoint. And we're gonna to have to keep track of that checkpoint so that when we come back, we can always pick up where we left off, right? So it's important we have that checkpoint. We're gonna to have to do that for both event hubs. So we take them and we store them in the raw storage layer here, right? Just put our tables down, not trying to do any kind of cleanup, nothing fancy, just drop the data. From there, we're gonna take it and we're going to cleanse it, right? We need to get rid of nulls and make sure we don't have any bad values and on and on. So we're gonna do that, we clean the data and we put it into a cleansed table. And then we wanna merge our store sales with our online sales. So we're gonna take those two tables and do a merge and put them in the sales table. So that's the point at which we would define and apply our validation rules. And we have to have code to not only identify situations where there's a violation, but also to handle that violation. So now we have our sales table. This is ready for querying. It's at the grain level, as they say in the old data warehousing, dimensional modeling world. It's at the, probably the transactional level, right? Well, we may want to do analytics on it and trying to take in that kind of volume, typically for something like Power BI or Tableau, isn't really a good idea usually. So you may want to do some level of aggregation and take a summarized version of the table and put it into, as we have here, aggregated sales. And aggregated sales is probably what you're going to be using for your analytics. Now, I ignored this sort of folder-based pipeline, but this is a little different. Many times we have some external files that we need to include in our data warehouse. So in this case, we have a vendor file. Our vendor invoices will get dropped into a folder. And when it does, we need to pull that file in, ingest it, and apply it to our pipeline so that we get it into our cleansed vendor invoices and ultimately into our aggregate vendor invoices. We're not going to bother with the detailed table at this point. We're just merging it directly in. So we'll need to have some sort of a polling process to know when did we get a new file in. And that's part of the challenge of doing this type of pipeline. Okay, so that's the old fashioned way of doing it. And if you were building this pipeline on Databricks, you would write some notebooks and they would handle every piece of this from beginning to end, exactly what to do. And you'd have to make sure if you use multiple notebooks and perhaps multiple workflows, that you know the order to run things in and what relates to what so that you get this right so that everything fits and works correctly. So what happens if I'm gonna use Delta Live table? Well, you're gonna just do a little change to your coding here to start with. First thing you're gonna do is you're going to tell Databricks in your code that each of these tables we're creating is actually a live table. And that keyword is literally what you use. This is an example of code where you say creating a table, create or refresh live table. When Databricks sees that live keyword in your code, it kind of goes bananas. And it does a lot of work behind the scenes to map things out and find out where are you getting data from and where is it going to and what are your rules? In other words, once you use that keyword, Databricks takes responsibility for maintaining that table. It takes a weight off your shoulders because now Databricks says, I'll take it from here. You told me that's a live table and I'll take over maintaining it and do a lot of work for you from this point on. And you'll notice also the polling process. Technically, auto loader is something that can be used outside of Delta Live tables, but it works really nicely when you use live tables with auto loader because what auto loader does is it monitors the folder. And once some event happens, like a new file is dropped in, it will automatically kick off your process to run your pipeline and load the data. So it takes that off of your shoulders as well. What other features do I get, Brian? Is it really worth all this? Well, we get automatic checkpoints and restart. So we don't have to kind of worry about that. And if we're getting it right and pulling the latest data in, we get the file drop and polling pipeline triggering. That was really part of auto loader, but hey, we'll include it too. We get the application and enforcement of validation rules. So if you see when we're merging into the sales table, we had to previously write code to check for these validation rules and then figure out what to do. Well, now it's automatic and we can tell Databricks in a definition declaration as part of our live table, what to do if one of these things is violated. We get automatic pipeline monitoring and errors and failures are handled with the ability to do restarts all within 
Delta Live pipelines. We get data lineage tracking, which is really important, right? You want to know where is this data coming from and going to. And we have support for schema evolution, but that's really part of Delta. But by incorporating it with our Delta Live pipelines, we can include the schema evolution feature as well, which means as new columns may get added, say, into our event hub, we can just include or decide what to do with those as our process evolves. And we get optimization and cluster management. What does that mean? It means that Databricks is going to figure out the best way to support ingesting and processing your pipeline. It's going to go through some algorithms and do some magic behind the scenes and find the best way to accomplish that, optimize your pipelines, and create and manage the clusters to process them. So there's a lot going on here. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. Now, I do want to emphasize Delta Live Tables is Databricks only. And I don't know, maybe down the road, I kind of hope they do open source it somehow. But at this point, it's probably difficult to do because Delta Live Tables are very integrated, it seems, with their workflow engine. It's part of when you when you create them, as we'll see later, you go into where you have workflows and jobs. And in there, they also have Delta Live Tables. Something I did mention is you cannot run Delta Live Table notebooks interactively. I'll say it again, cannot run these notebooks interactively. You create your code in notebooks, but you cannot run those notebooks interactively because Databricks has to be given the chance to kind of go through this analysis of your live table definitions before the real pipeline is built. So that's about it for now. I want to thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe. Until next time, I'm pulling for all in this together. Thank you.